Um, so I welcome, I'm Lisa Floyd, I'm the principal. And Jason Finley, associate principal. David White, parent. I was just going to share a little bit about power school this year. Okay. It's something that I, I've struggled with from my older son who's gone through. So like for six years, I feel like we've gone back and forth between different programs. Mm -hmm. It's been hard to sign up the right way and get teachers to actually, and then you finally get on the right program and then teachers weren't using it quite right. So there's just like the feedback loop of grades to parents mm -hmm. has been a struggle for like six plus years. Uh, so I had kind of given up going into this year to be okay. honest. And, um, but I had a positive experience where my son basically downloaded the app on my phone and he logged in as himself. Okay. And it's been working amazingly well. So I got two great updates today and when he's late, embarrassingly too, I'm too often late, I get a, like a tardy absence like the yep. minute he's late. Mm -hmm. So that, that, and or attendance if he's late, if, yep. he's, if, he's, if we know he's going to be out that day. And I've kind of liked that feedback loop more than I have in any other previous year. So I don't know if it's the same when parents log in or if I'm just getting this experience because he logged me in as himself, but I kind of like that so far. Nice. Um, so one thing that we did differently this year is we had run a two-year pilot of Schoology, which was a standards-based grading platform that we adopted because we were trying to be responsive to needs with proficiency-based grading. And PowerSchool had not yet implemented standards-based grading. So what they did was a 1 was a 25. A two was a 50, a three was automatically a 75, so it put everything on a 100-point scale. And a three is actually proficient and impacts your grade, your GPA far better than a 75. So they finally adopted a standards-based grading platform. We took the other system, Schoology, out of the way, and we're down to just the one clean... Um, SMS, which is a student management system, which um, student information system, SIS, which does all of the attendance, all of the tardies, all of that stuff. But it's also our grading platform or learning management system. And so it's all in one place. And we also shared with teachers the expectation that grades get entered every two weeks. Good. And we've reinstated interim reports for this year. So. Those will go home, I think we're planning like October 10th or something like that, um, just because when we discussed it with our leadership team this summer, the frustration of families of not seeing grades on a regular basis, um, they thought having that deadline in the center of the quarter actually helped. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we also reinstituted our co-curricular eligibility policy linked to yeah, habits. Linked to habits yep. So, yeah, I'm glad that that was a positive experience. That's yeah. good feedback. And it feels like maybe it's always been this way, but like I feel like the tardiness for my son, I think it's good to get that immediate. Mm -hmm. To get the conversation when you get home, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It hasn't turned more. I mean, he's 50 50 this week, so. <laughs> yeah. Gets better. That's awesome. Actually, well, it's good to put too, because I'll put that in the newsletter to for our teachers to let them know that there is a positive experience on the on the parental side, at least you know in this in this case. Yeah, I'm one, I don't know if the parent login is the same. Um, and when I say I was sort of ready to give up, like I think my son came home with one it was a syllabus or something a math teacher wanted signed off. Okay. Of course, didn't give it to me until about ten minutes before we had to leave. <laughs> We're probably already late. I've already known him. But um, so I'm signing it quickly. But it was like. It was really driving home the use of power school, but it was like a page worth of instructions around it. When my son did it, it wasn't that complicated. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very valuable tool for parents, and it should be expressed in a way of how simple it is. Download the app, enter the code, that's it. Like, keep it that simple. If it's a page of instructions, you're going to lose people's attention, right. I think. Yep. I hope the parent one is as easy. Like, I didn't log in as myself. I'm logged in as my son, so mm -hmm. hopefully the parent one works similarly. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, too. Good. Is Tammy coming? No. Okay. Hi. How are you? Twice one day? I know. That's wonderful. Only because I cleaned the closet out the first time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've All right. I've had time since I've been retired. The 
that's when I found that stuff, and I was like, I might as well bring it down to school. Yeah. That's great. So we're just sort of giving people a little bit of time, hi, to ask any questions you might have or share anything that's on your mind. And then we have something we were going to ask of all of you, too. So, so far, um, I talked about power school a little bit and the struggles I've had over the last six years, but the positive experience I've had in the last couple of weeks. So, so power school is the app of like communicating with your aides. So my son logged me in as Emmy. Okay, because I'm not tech savvy doesn't mean I don't know what power school is. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it's like squad. I said like squad. Like, I don't know. I have, but yeah, you're in the system. Yeah. I don't, I don't have anything to bring to the table right now. I just was going to come listen and see mm -hmm. what's happening. All right. I'm confused about what we're supposed to talk about in each one of these because is this the high school one or the district one? This is the high school one. Yep. And then I suspect in about half an hour, 45 minutes, Lane and Heather will show up and then we will transition like out at 6.30. So okay. Save my comment for that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so if that's the case then. So this is high school. You want to hear other things that are on our minds? So yes. Yes. I'm super excited about the um, the academic or the sports eligibility. Eligibility. <laughs> yeah. The habit scores. Yes. Yeah. Really excited. It's been really fun to tell the kids like you need to be a good human being or you're not going to play sports, and I'm really serious about that. So it's really nice to have the back of the school. Thank you. To, to say that and the cell phone policy. <laughs> I can't wait to hear from you guys on how that's going. Um, super psyched to see that as well. I wanted to share with you, Lisa, something that um, I experienced when school, kind of when schedules went out this, yeah. um, just before school started. And uh, on Facebook, on social media, there was a big kind of lashing, what is this insanity of these waterfall schedules? Okay. Um, which I was like, oh, geez, here we go, you know. Um, and thankfully, because of that parent group that we sat on this spring, Kat has heard me tell the story like four times now. Um, <laughs> it, I was able to be like, hey, like, I know what this is all about. And there was a lot of like bad kind of bashing of it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to speak up because I, I learned about this. And I had the same response as you guys in the beginning, but, um, you know, I explained like what you guys taught us about how different kids, like at different times of the day, like learn better. And it's, it's like more fair for all the teachers and all the people that have these kids all day long. Um, and once I did that, like the mom who started it was like, wow, thanks. You know, oh, that's awesome. I had never thought about it like that. And I was like, wow, that really worked. You know, it was just really cool to be like, just getting that little bit of education and like that communication went just so far. Um, and I found that with several things that like came up um, that we had got to talk about in those smaller groups. and. Um, it, I felt empowered to be able to like step in and say something about it because otherwise I probably would have had that same like, feeling Action, when I yeah. saw it. Even though Jackson only had like two things on his schedule when it came and he was psyched because it was like gin and <laughs> He's like, why did you call Kara? Oh, well, buddy. From, yes, yeah. yep. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share that. That's awesome, thank you. Oh, and also like, if you have student athletes and they're leaving early in the day, they're not consistently missing the same class every yeah. week. It's kind of spread across, you know, sharing that um, across all the classes. Yeah. I also received some good feedback about the schedule from my students. Okay. He, he said he liked it better this year. And I think it had to do with the uh, not having such large blocks of time. Mm -hmm. His attention span, his ability to get up, get the blood flowing, move around. Um, he says that's working better for him so far this year. The only negative thing I heard, and it wasn't from the teacher, but I just observed, is like I was talking to Ms. Schooner, and she's like, oh, you know, we have to be a little more creative about when to find a time to go out to the river and do some experiments, because we don't have the big block that we used to have. But right. she didn't sound down on it at all. She just said, you know, we're going to have to find a time to do it, and we'll do it. Yep. Yeah, I think, I think one of the positives, too, is that there is a lot of intentionality. When you have a little less than an hour to use, it feels like there's a sense of urgency of the time that you have, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Right. Is there an ability for those classes that would do something like that? Like, I 
remember when we had those shorter blocks, there was some classes that had like a lab. A double block, yeah. Right, a double block one time a week or something because mm -hmm. it allowed for that longer process. Do they have that we, or something? I, I think right now we're sort of trying this yes. and seeing what the needs are. Um, there is the capacity to call students back during the callback block. Um, we haven't double class, double blocked any classes yet, um, because actually the way it shook out in terms of time, um, students are make. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but they have so much more time on learning in class that they're gaining like days of class over weeks and months, and so it that feels really good. So they're having more time in class, particularly at the middle level. Um, so they're having more time on learning overall with this schedule. But um, the lab sciences, we haven't done that for. So we'll see. AP Bio is being taught in the same size block as everything else. And so far, it sounds like it's working out OK. Hi, Ramsey. Hi. Um, yeah. Yeah. But welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just starting with anything people have on their minds and would like like to share with us as we jump into this new school year. We all went. No, you all went. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. Well, I just came because I was just in a meeting where I was saying how the, the school was very important to the community in general and vice versa. And so I decided that I should come too. Okay. That's wonderful. And you're the parent of oh, sorry. I'm a parent alumni. Of past ch children who went through this school. And, um, yeah. yeah. It gets posted. It's Orca Media. Okay. All right. Um, well, we have a request for all of you if you have asked your questions, et cetera. So one of the things that we're doing this school year is um, spending some time developing a communications plan to get information out about the positive things that are happening and the hard things that are happening, just more clear and effective communication. Um, so one of the ways that we thought we'd collect information is just to share, to ask people to share thank their you. perceptions, thank you, of um, our school. And so, we asked um, just some really open-ended questions that we thought we could use as a springboard for discussion this evening um, and then also get, they would give us an area of focus like where to start in terms of addressing perceptions and help them more closely align with the reality of what we do. Is that an adequate description? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's not a pop quiz. Okay. Good. <laughs> like, I think this is going to be deeper thoughts. She probably won't type this, so you can read what I write. Oh no, I can read. I taught eighth grade English for sixteen years. <laughs> I can read everybody's handwriting. Yeah. yeah. Um, right now, what we mainly did, we just barely um, created a new Facebook presence. 
I don't know if those of you who get my newsletter each week have noticed down at the bottom there's a teeny tiny link to Facebook. Um, we just, our Facebook last fall was filled with harsh things and then um, eventually crashed when our system was hacked. And so we've lived without it for about a year. So we did a little bit of a toe dip into <laughs> social media again. Um, so there's that. Um, we communicate mostly through a weekly newsletter that we put out um, for parents. And we can do robocalls when we need to. We reach out to the Herald when we have an opportunity or something to really celebrate or something that feels newsworthy. Um, we've added the Herald to our newsletter um, listserv so that it goes to them as well as everybody else. So if there's like a, on our newsletter, there's a mark your calendars section. And so if there's something on there that they see that they want to cover, um, they, can, they can come here. Um, I think that's most of it. update forget where we left off with the homework policy um, the, the next yeah the that's more the next meeting um, the homework policy we collected feedback from the advisory board um, Lane collected feedback from staff um, I think students had an opportunity when talking about the portrait of a graduate work um, which we had a lot of student voice in to give some feedback and I think they're hoping to get near a final draft on it. So I know that they really appreciated the thoughtful feedback that our Family and Community Advisory Board gave them. Because I had several, I think three or four pages of notes just from our small group that I was able to share. And then, of course, our meetings like this one are on Orca Media if people choose to watch. I, just, I loved when I was a parent having, getting the newsletters and knowing what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I felt like as soon as I wasn't a parent of a child in the school anymore, I <clears throat> had no. no idea what was happening in the school. So I just think it would be great. To, I think it's great to figure out a way that either if it's community members who aren't parents in the school can subscribe to your newsletter or whatever mm -hmm. to, to have something where. I've been posting it on our Facebook um, each week. We yeah. have two followers on the new Facebook right. so far. Right. I, just follow, I just followed you. All right. Okay. Go. <laughs> All right. It's the one that has <laughs> the picture. Off, it, um, with the rainbow. Yeah, with the rainbow. Okay. Yep. Got the right one. Yep. <laughs> Do that before Yeah. So, middle high school, yep. Oh, we're up to eight? Yeah, nice. Nice. All right, great. Um, and then we have a staff member, so Michelle Holder is our media specialist, and she's agreed to cover events for us and um, cover events for us and write articles that we can push out to the newsletter and our social media and the Herald. Which is already in the Herald today because I saw Michelle's name. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, really? Wonderful. Yeah. Was it about the scuba program over the summer? Okay, because I knew she was working on one for that. I don't. I. Oh. All right. Yeah. 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 or talk about them or ask questions, I don't know. I feel like we're a pretty small and friendly group, so. I guess 
I wanted to ask, like, what are your visions um, for trying to overcome these negative perceptions that we all kind of know are there, like coming on the heels of last year? Um, what, what can we do to, uh, to change that for the whole community, not just the parents and the students? Um, because I think it is a much broader. feel like those of us who do have kids and it can feel more passionate about it and okay about it because mm -hmm. we, we see these wonderful kids and we're with them all the time but how can we let everybody else see that and I think having that bigger media presence which unfortunately that's the way the world works now is just I mean, social media but um, kind of celebrating the good that those kids do and um, the good things that are happening here every day so. yeah um our, our plan in a lot of ways right now is to reinstitute advisory boards for PBL and because um, you were on the PBL advisory board pre-COVID. I think you were too, Ramsey. Um, so we want to have one for our innovation center as well as PBL um, because we feel like it's very important to hear from um, local businesses in the STEM fields around what their needs are and in terms of what we're teaching students um, and also in the PBL realm I know the PBL group is planning a lot of events already yeah I think in part of my work last year so before I became the social principal I was in the innovation center and working um, on building up because COVID, right? We stopped bringing people in and we stopped having students go out. And so, working on more community connections um, and thinking about the career exploration piece and how that informs post secondary pathway planning. Uh, so, our new director down there is looking at how do we, um, CCV is having a, an, a day where they're, they're bringing a bunch of students up to Central Vermont Medical Center, exploring all the different careers in healthcare. Um, and then the, the educational pathways that could lead to those that you could access through the Vermont State Colleges. And so exposing our students to the, like the world of work as well as how that ties into post-secondary education. So that's gonna be a large focus of his work that was started um, in large part last year. That was a continuation of some work that Ken Cotto did when he first came in workforce development. And so just kind of like re-energizing that work that he had done and you know, that because we're past COVID, we're way past COVID. And so time to bring that back to the surface because it is meaningful for kids to find a sense of purpose in their work for some of these, their classwork, their academic work, and connecting that to that future future planning. Yeah. So that's part of the work that will be happening down there, especially with the STEM fields, um, but all, all career paths. Yeah, I think the more we can get these kids around uh, adults in professions, um, it's all the better. It was amazing. I sat on a uh, panel last year. I um, can't remember what the focus was, but it was kind of people with like diversified backgrounds and kind of like what got them to where they are today. So <clears throat> I was asked to sit on that, and there was a really interesting group of us. There was like a death investigator from mm -hmm. Vermont State Police, and um, yep. um, like myself, and somebody who'd gone into agriculture, and somebody who were working on diesel engines. And, um, just the state highway department. Yeah, I mean, there's just different people, and um, they, when we kind of would turn it over to the kids, like, do you have questions? Or, you know, like, they just clamped up. It was like they didn't yeah. know what to do with all of us in the room. Um, and you could tell, like, it had been years since they had had us there. Right. You know, they just kind of didn't know what to do with us there. That was sad to see, and I mm -hmm. hope that that um, will, you know, hopefully we get them back with us and people back in the school. Yeah, and that takes practice, right? That, that, yeah. that social engagement. Yeah. Um, and part of the class I taught last year, we would spend days on how do you make a telephone call? I get the old rotary phone and you pick it up and I was at the other end and like, this feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, they hate them. it. Right, they hate it. Um, yeah, but how do you engage with people? It's a skill. It's a skill that has to be learned and developed. And um, So that, again, that's part of the work that will be happening with our, our director that's down there. And I think, um, you know, Kathy knows this because she went through um, PD with us some of the time. So I think often when we've been through really hard things, we focus on 
trauma-informed work and really supporting people. And that whole body of evidence is beginning to shift toward um, healing-focused work. So it's subtle, but it's really looking at rather than what you've experienced or lived, but like how you can find your strengths and then work to heal from the, the traumas you've experienced and come through that and, and how you can be effective um, and pursue your goals and dreams. And so I think shifting some of our focus with students is on helping them develop greater self-efficacy skills and learn about themselves that they can do the things we're asking them to do and they can talk to adults and they right. you know can help people in the community because i think that's one of the most powerful levers we have in terms of getting students to a more positive place um, I just think about the group of students that we worked with when when they were delivering Veggie Van Gogh foods to the Randolph house and how positive that was for our kids, but also how positive it was for the elders who lived there. Um, it, it was more about the interaction almost than the food they were bringing um, because the kids were developing the skills of knocking on the door with safe people, um, talking to them. In some cases, you know, someone might not have been feeling well and it was pre-COVID, so they would say, like, I can put this in the refrigerator for you. Um, and just like helping other people helps people feel good about themselves of all ages. So. I think that's able to reach the kids. I really appreciate the focus on those with trauma, but then I also do think there's kids that like kind of came out of COVID fine, you know, like they didn't mm -hmm. have anything super traumatic and or they don't view themselves as having gone through trauma. And so, and I sometimes think that groups kind of gets forgotten a little bit or not focused on. So I think also framing it maybe a little differently to them to remember those kids. I mean, I think about my own son and he probably wouldn't tell you that he's had any trauma from him. Mm -hmm. Right. Just want to do yeah. school yeah. and play basketball right. <laughs> or baseball. Yeah. yeah. Or, all the or all the sports. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some of the things we've been communicating. Also, our you know our test scores were. We are a school who has gained, even if it's been limited gains throughout COVID. Um, we haven't had the 10 or 15% setbacks that some schools have experienced. And so I think that really speaks to the resilience of our kids and our teaching staff as well. Um, so as we started to just get a first glimpse at our spring testing scores, they, they're not terrible. Um, and we're still moving forward. And so I think that's an important thing to focus on too, because it's not that way everywhere. Um, and the work that happens here is, is good work in a lot of ways. We always have room to grow, but yeah. I mean, right now we're experiencing a little bit of growing pains from the cell phone policy. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I think students were a large part of the population that was asking for more, more structure. structure around cell phones. You know, they they were disrupting. For, they saw the disruption that it could cause. You know, when someone's sitting next to me, my teachers constantly have to ask them to put it away, and then it's taking away their learning time. Um, they they realize that, and so I I think we're seeing that you know a few are struggling with it, but I think mostly the response has been. Like positive from the students, you know, they still kind of like, well, I'm in between classes, like in the bag, right? It's like, it's either at lunch, before school, or after school, and that's it. Yeah, lunch. Yeah, I got a text lunch. yesterday around that time. I said, like, put your phone away. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that it took the onus off the teachers also to have to enforce that. It's like, 
Yeah. I mean, they have still to afford it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't so important. Yeah. yeah, the style, I don't think it's overly restrictive, right? So, so the, first, the first time it happens, they do get a pink slip, so sometimes I put some, like, well, this is my first, like, we're just it's documentation, right? Just put it away, and as long as they put it away, it's, it's for documentation. And the second time, they will leave it at the front office. And then they can actually come and pick it up at the end of school, right? So it's like still, and then once you get to the third time, that's when a parent has to come and get it. Um, but what, we're, what we'll start to see maybe more of that now that we've been in long enough, is it's not by the day or by the class, that's cumulative. So if it happened on Monday in this class, and Tuesday in this class, and Thursday in this class, that's three, that's number three. So it's, we're, we're getting that point, I think, in the school year where some of those students might be creeping up to that. Will, the, 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 will the, parents be told on one and two? They should be receiving phone calls. You should be receiving yeah. phone calls from the teacher. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So they must be doing okay. <laughs> he told me the other day and I like my heart sank. I was like, what did he do? And then I'm like, oh wait, she's not there anymore. Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Trauma there. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think um, the vape sensors I think are really helpful. Um, yeah, I was anticipating that that would be all consuming of my day. So what happens is as soon as a vape sensor goes off, um, we receive, there's a number of us that receive these email notifications, but it's been really minimal. So where are they looking? Everywhere. Right, uh, right, so. Not um, arrows to them. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. Oh, the kids know what they are. Yeah. 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 So what we, what we tell students is in bathrooms and places where we had um, problems in the past. Uh -huh. So that kind of leaves it open to where that might be. Now that we're talking about bathrooms, I'm curious if the doors are open, closed, or on, or off, or if there's anything to do with that. The doors are on, um, but we have been clear that if the level of vandalism and vape and making younger students feel unwelcome gets back to where it was, then, then we'll have to talk about it again um, because the bathrooms are for everybody. Is there so. more you can share about the vape results of those sensors so far? So they, they let us know, you know, um, they let us know when there's a vape event they let us know when there's an event that might be an aggression event um, because the way it's been explained to me is that they develop, we don't hear what's going on in any given place, but they have a sensor that develops like a common level of sound. And when something is atypical, then it alerts. Um, so we have um, reinstituted a senior lounge for seniors who have, um, who've earned senior privileges. So they have to maintain those privileges in order to be able to access the lounge. They were very happy about it. They were playing a game there the other day and apparently there was some cheering which <laughs> registered as an aggression event. <laughs> um, and they were really surprised when three of us showed up to see what was happening. But um, that was okay. You know, I think it's good for them to know that we're taking it seriously and we're mm -hmm. going to be there. Some students have tried to test it, like, oh, if I, well, if I spray this cologne or apron, and it knows it doesn't. Go it didn't off. work. Didn't work. And they're like now, like, like send a message now. Nope, nope. So I, it, they're accurate. I was worried when I wanted when they said they wanted to try it. They were like, we're going to test it. We're going to spray our body spray. And I thought, if they know that the body spray throws it off, we're going to be in trouble. And it didn't. So, so we could honestly say it responds to vape. Yep. So that was good. Good information. Um, and I can think of at least two students so far who have accessed cessation counselors because they're tired of talking to us <laughs> already. And it, we're two and a half weeks in or two weeks in, just about, so. That feels positive. Yeah. As a general theme, I feel like that's been 
positivity has been a theme across the school this year. I don't know what you're hearing at homes or, but the, from the um, open house, just so much positive feedback from families. Um, it was good to, good to hear and feel, and I feel like it's been, from the staff too and the students, it's been a pretty positive year. I think so. I mean, it's not without right. struggle, but. We're still a 7 through 12 school. And <laughs> students are students and kids are kids. Yep. Been a conversation no. <laughs> yeah, we started at 530 and we started with people's feedback and questions and then we're collecting perceptions. Um, so, yeah. But we have graphic organizers because sometimes I just have to make them. Like the old teacher part of me dies hard. So we are. Oh, that's a graphic That's a graphic organizer. Yeah. Worksheet, whatever you want to call it. Ask for more time while we're taking it home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll allow it. But we think we're going to have a musical this year. We have 30 students signed up in after-school theater. We have eight students signed up in after-school dance. So those are four credit classes in the fine arts. And our dance teacher is working with a PE teacher so that we can offer PE credit for dance. Yeah. Um, and then we have a, we split the music position. We were having trouble finding a suitable candidate. Um, and then we found a really strong choral music teacher who fills the point five of the position and an instrumental music teacher who accepted a point five position. So our arts hallway is so vibrant during the school day. And after school today, our rock band was playing and dance class was happening and um, people in our innovation center were still printing with the 3D printers after school. So was a happening place down here. <laughs> All right, well, that's, would you talk about the um, after school bus? Yeah, that's and exciting so, too. Right, which opens up a ton of opportunities. Yep. Um, for students, uh, uh, you might have more information about it than that, but it runs for all, all five days? It's running what? all five days. Um, so because we have classes happening after school that students can get credit for, um, it's important to be able to get them home afterwards. So if you wanted your student to access the late bus, um, there is a Google form that's in our newsletter and you would fill that out. Um, and then we check attendance partway through the morning and cross-reference that with the day that you've signed up to attend. Um, and then Danny, our director of transportation, figures out which buses will run um, based on ridership and then they show up between 4.15 and 4.30 and take the students home. Um, and so right now we don't have as many riders as I think we will have. It seems like we're gaining more and more every day as kids realize that it's a resource available to them. Um, and I think the elementary schools are starting October 15th, right? Um, so then we'll have more students who can attend after school programming at the elementary level and then hop on the buses um, and go home closer to when mom and dad get home. We're exploring, exploring tutoring options for students after school. Um, and again, uh, part of that effort too of uh, increasing educational opportunities is that when a student can take that classes after school, that means their they're calendar in the day, they're not making this decision, do I take AP Calc or do I take theater? You can also, all of a sudden you can take both. Um, so that's one of the, the benefits for our students is that kind of opens up that those opportunities for them. Yeah. One and thing I think it would be helpful, I know with my son, he doesn't fully understand like why he needs to take some of those classes that he may not be excited about, like art. And I tried to explain to him that it's part of his curriculum that he has to complete and for colleges or graduation, like that's all required. So if you put it off, like it's gonna be there at the end um, and that there's more things you're going to have to take and you can't just take gym all morning. So um, I think a little, and maybe he's just ignoring it if you're doing it, I apologize. 
um, but just focus for them on that planning, that four-year planning, mm -hmm. um, and why you need to like check these marks off, um, the benefits to doing it early versus leaving mm -hmm. um, until your last year, but that could be helpful. Back up. <laughs> I know they do some of that at the end of eighth grade, but it's such a frantic time. Um, we also, what else have we done? That's new. We also bought an SEL or social emotional learning curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the one that we um, got is called Wayfinder. And it is aimed specifically at grade seven through 12. So a lot of that goal setting and understanding your four year plan is built in. Um, one of the things that we realized is that advisory depended a lot on which advisor you got. So if you had more than one child, you probably know that went through our school system that sometimes you might get an advisor who like communicates really well and you feel like you understand everything and sometimes your child might get an advisor who is great for them because they play a lot of basketball but not great at some of the other things. Um, so we're hoping to develop equity around advisory and making sure that all students get what we expect them to get in advisory through using this curriculum. And one of the things I'm excited about is like the goal setting and the opportunity to have a conversation about those pathways. And it also has different lessons for different grade levels so that over time students will you know, start setting goals that are appropriate for seventh graders. But then in ninth grade, it's like starting to look more at college and career readiness and what you need to realize your goals and dreams. So we haven't ruled that out yet. We were giving people an opportunity to do some of the team building and all of that beginning of the school year work. Um, but that should be happening in the next two weeks. Um, I, I also wanted to focus a little bit, because um, you were asking about the things that, you know, in terms of community perceptions that maybe we wish people knew more about at the beginning. And I think um, in our area, it's really remarkable that our students got to go snorkel in Key Largo last year and experience science hands-on in the ocean. Um, we are in a landlocked state. We don't live in a particularly wealthy area in the state. And um, students in the marine ecology class, regardless of their ability, their family's ability to pay for that trip, they fundraised, they wrote grants, they did all of those things. And so students were able to go on that trip. I think it's really special that we offer dance for credit after school at a public school. Um, I also know that this summer we had 13 students become certified scuba divers, which is remarkable. Um, and they are fundraising and beginning to plan for a trip. They got a big grant um, that will allow them to use their scuba diving skills to plant coral in a coral reef that's been really impacted by the ocean becoming warmer. So they're studying about our world and ways to make a positive impact and then they're going to do it so that's pretty exciting and where else we went last year we went to japan we had kids um, yep morocco. who Mor morocco, morocco japan yep right so it's exchanges on its way here yep in october the cooks oven troop trip will be here those students will be here yep yeah, so shared and people are more likely to watch them than read like an article that they might uh -huh. see in the Herald. Right. Um, as sad as that is, that print just doesn't help. I know, that's... But I think a video of those <laughs> heartwarming stories when the parents share it, you know, it just kind of spirals. So I think those types of things are uh -huh. created that they should kind of be. And then they hear the voices of the kids and um, see the excitement. But one of our graduating seniors last year as the rationale for the decision that we made and so we sat with him and explained the whole thing and he was like that should be a TikTok. this was a three-minute conversation <laughs> and I understand right. and I was like I don't know if I'm ready to become a TikToker, <laughs> but okay 
Exactly. Right. That would be perfect. <laughs> we have all our theater kids, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I do think there's something to be said for video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's good feedback. What's that? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't think anybody in the world needs more negative videos. Oh, wonderful. Oh, nice. From the tech center. He's in his second year of video. He did our portrait of a graduate video last year. He's the one who made it. Mm -hmm. So ideas like this, um, I, have, I have a student with skills identified. Sweet. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't sure if that was still being offered at the tech center. It is. Yes. It's a yeah. wonderful program, yeah. and it's full. Great, yeah. great I, instructor. Uh, yeah. Great instructor, yeah. 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 May capitalize on that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's and so I, easy. I just need Jackson to come home, like to help me <laughs> do this, and so and that's just the way of the world now. Is this mm -hmm. Video on social media, for those kids out there. Yeah. Any other questions for us? I know my car ride home, there's gonna be like 20 other things. I'm like, I wish I would have shared that we're doing this and that. Talk about the doubled up math and. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I was gonna get there, yeah. So we used the data from last school year um, in combination with the information about, we used to have like Lit Lab and Math Lab, and it was a lot of like homework completion blocks, um, and it, it wasn't really moving students forward in terms of skill development. And so what we've done this year is use the data from late last year to populate learning extensions in math and literacy. And um, students can test out of them and come out on a quarter basis. Um, but they're really focused on skill development. So the STAR 360 test, we sent home scores with schedules last year. Um, we use the, that data to help populate these extensions if students need skill development. That program also will identify where the skill gaps are for students and it will group them and it um, supports teachers in understanding where they may need to do some greater development or focus. And so that's the curriculum that we're using in those extensions and students have been really overwhelmingly positive about it. Um, just had a student today who showed up and he was like, I don't know that I want to do this. Like, I'm scheduled into it and I didn't take the test seriously last year and you know I didn't take the test seriously. And so we just said, we're gonna give the test again. Take it seriously. But we're not giving up on your capacity to learn. I mean, this student wants to have his own business one day. He needs to be able to communicate. And he was like, fine, if I, if I am struggling on the test, then I will stay. But if I can pass it when I really try, I want out. So we agreed and, and we'll see how it goes. As his scores have been close to the cut score a couple times, but you just don't know. I, I feel like, Yeah. Give them some ownership, too. He has two math classes, and he grumbles about two math classes, but then he goes, I actually really like my teachers. It's kind of fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I also think having those conversations, it makes, it makes the kids feel really cared for. Mm -hmm. like we're really paying attention to what they do. And kids, uh, well, I can't remember what survey it was, but our kids want to be challenged. They've, they shared it in a survey. They want to be challenged to try his, to be their best. And so this is part of that, you know, making sure that 
everyone's reaching their, their peak potential, whatever their own, their own potential is, but they want that challenge. Ms. Miller, there was a question earlier, and neither of us had off the top of their head, um, around the schedules. What was the total, over the course of a year or the, the student's time here, what's the total number of days or hours are, are we adding with this, these small schedule changes? Do you, uh, do you know off the top of your head? So, and I, I think it's a little reduced from this because of, of the advisor and people on the Xbox. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we did the analysis, I mean, the biggest thing that's gonna improve the students kind of academically is time for teachers. Right? That's the biggest leverage point. Uh, and so we did an analysis a year or two ago about you know how much time on learning are the students actually spending uh, versus you know what's kind of the national norm. Uh, and they, they were quite shy, but there were lots of areas in the schedule where, where, where time could be made up. And so the maximally um, based upon the schedule, it would add 175 learning hours per year, uh, which is significant. It's almost like an additional class and then I did the calculation a little further if the students are here from um, you know middle school and high school it's 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 about an additional year of learning that they wouldn't have had with us. and so it, it makes a huge significant and the, the scores at like the high school have actually been going up the last couple of years even even during COVID um, but one of the things I'm worried about is we still don't have a ninth grade score. I know. Not coming out until the end of the month but we had that disruption right with uh, the heating Mm -hmm. last year and so that's going to have an impact and we'll see what that again is but again current ninth grade or last year's last year's ninth grade yeah. well anybody who was at the high school will be able to impact them because you know they lost probably about three weeks mm -hmm. when you guys did that analysis wasn't most of the pickup in teacher time because of getting rid of things like the call back call back um, the daily advisories and so one of the discussions that we had, uh, like on the advisories, which is why the SEL program was brought in, you know, we talked about the Wayfinder, was advisories are actually not a bad thing if you have a curriculum that everybody is following. Um, and so that was kind of built in. Um, I think they weeded back a little bit of the time. I think they got rid of one of the callbacks. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the students are actually picking up even more instruction time, because we were talking earlier the teachers have smaller windows of time. They don't have these huge blocks anymore, so they're being more urgent and, and you know, with their time, they're being more sp more strategic, I guess. But I, I rem and, the, and the cell phone policy, I think, is helping too, because when, the, when my, I know my son, when he had a huge block, if he finished his work, he finished his work. The teacher didn't throw more work at him, he was like, I want a cell phone. So, yeah, I think those two things are helping a lot too. Yeah, the 90-minute blocks um, are, I did my, my, my research for my last degree on, 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 on schedules, 90 minute blocks are, are tough. Um, unless you're an art teacher or science teacher, it's hard to manage the time and maintain a sense of urgency with the kids and the teachers. About the 60 minute point, somewhere in there, 55 to 65 minutes is the sweet spot which they, they've hit. Um, so they, they've got a really good schedule right now that they've developed. So. They're resistant to wait time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Well, I, mean, I'm, I'm here as well. I usually do hang out um, more kind of at the district level um, piece, so I'm happy if there's questions district level or district priorities. Um, it sounds like you did a little bit of the mental model discussions. Um, we did. That's Yeah, that's what the graphic organizers are. So I'll take those if you're ready to hand them back or drop them off any time. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming out tonight.